Hello, Rob. How are you? I am trying to get my camera to work right. It looks good so far. I'm going to have to leave at uh, nine as usual on the first Monday for my board meeting. That's okay. I don't think there will be many people here today. There's a lot of holidaying things happening. So that's, uh, that's kind of fair enough. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, move this up. So, um, question for you then. Uh, one of the things I'm doing now is um, it's doing an intensive uh, month of, uh, hang on, I'm just going to remove this. We don't need this. Uh, an intensive month of development of author for Mac so that when we meet up in Poland, it will be able to do things such as export to LaTeX. So you don't have to fiddle around with that. What are the primary things that are important for you with your work processor? Uh, oh, boy. Well, you know, I, I write fiction, so it's... Um got its own set format which uh author doesn't do um but i think author is going to be useful for note taking and i do a lot of note taking when i'm writing so uh what what is it uh, <clears throat> that author doesn't do in terms of your writing fiction it doesn't format you know indented paragraphs double spaced um, as far as I know. <clears throat> Indented paragraphs, okay. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm so used to pages now that uh it's hard for me to think. Okay, so it's the formatting. Uh, That's really cool. Thank you. That's really good to to know. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Thompson. But I think that it's going to be very useful for note taking. So that that may be where I hmm. where I would put my effort. Uh, I what I do now is keep notes in a separate uh, Word uh, pages file, and then I create a table of contents. I just create uh, table TC uh, entries with uh, uh, head headline. I mean. Uh, formatting the headline and uh but i'm a very messy uh note taker so it's all over the place but i have often end up with as much text in my notes as i do in my file in, in the actual document that is interesting but if i if i could write it in uh, uh author i would yeah, no, that, that's nice of you. Um, at this point, I'm more trying to find out what people really need so that I prioritize better. So it's more about the other way around in a sense. So my primary audience is academic writing, of course, but it doesn't preclude others. So that means uh, what we're now we're doing now is LaTeX, which is turning out to be very interesting in the export dialogue. You just copy it. There's a button you copy. You go to your um, overleaf or whatever and you paste because LaTeX is basically almost used, almost always used in a template. So to export a ready-made LaTeX would be extremely arduous, I think. But this way, it's just copy and paste. And yeah. we're going to do a markdown, both import and export. It seems people like that. But right now, we're trying to find out. Andrew, where do you do your writing when you do writing? Pages or Word or something like that? Hmm. I guess it's been a while since I've gone and written big documents. Um, so about when I did, it was, I just used Google Docs a lot. Google Docs, fair enough. Are, I, I grew up using Word. So that was like the closest equivalent once I realized Word was subscription-based. Plus I'm on Windows, so what else do I have? Yes. When I was working at Apple, I had to use Word 1.0 to write uh technical documents at Apple and I hated it and uh, the last edition of Word I used I also hated 
but pages wouldn't do um, a table of contents with headlines, with headers, head, you know, formatted. Um, headers. Yeah, headers. And, uh, and Word would. So I kept using Word and then pages put it in and I immediately jumped to that and uh, stopped using Word. I have a, a a strong dislike for Microsoft, so. Yeah, I'm developing the same for Adobe. Uh, the, the amount of money Adobe to too. software yeah. now is horrible. So I liked Adobe they, back was, when it was, everything wasn't for subscriptions. Yeah, and I now know. my opinion has crashed a lot. The subscription model is awful. It's good for developers. I would love to have it for my software. I just think it's wrong, quite simply. You know, it's just, um, yeah. Dini, how was your birthday week? Oh my gosh, we had some, you know, it's the thing is we start on the 27th because that's the wedding anniversary. And we went to see the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, which is one of my favorite New Orleans bands. At the, the small venue, we had front row seats. It was fantastic. Did you go to did New Orleans that, or did they come to Washington? State? They came to Washington. They came to Portland, Oregon and played at the Alberta Rose Theater, which is this small venue, like 300 seats. So really intimate, like a New Orleans, you know, like a New Orleans jazz environment. And you got to dance and it was just so much fun. And then the, that was the 27th, the 28th. We uh, That was the anniversary of when we arrived here. So we always celebrate our arrival. So we're starting our 19th year now here. And then my birthday just kept kept rolling towards my birthday. John took me to the beach on my birthday, and we had a lovely time there. Got to see the salt water, which I love. And um, and then we ended up on Saturday night ending our celebration by seeing the Gypsy Kings. Oh, I, I don't know if you know who they are, but Eduardo Reyes, Nicholas Reyes. He's Nicholas Reyes is a was a traveler as a child and. Grippa started a band out of the music he was raised on. So he called himself the Gypsy Kings and they play this incredible music, you know, from Spain, Spanish traveler. So it's a mixture of kind of the Spanish tradition with traveler music. And anyway, he's probably now in his eighties. So it was great to see, you know, see him perform, which I had never seen before. So yeah, we did a lot of stuff. I mean, it was like nonstop. My brother had me over for dinner. So we just, but I got a lot of work done, too, which is great. So I kind of, you know, took it easy in the afternoons, but worked in the mornings. So you've turned 40 now? Yeah, I know. It's just so hard to believe. <laughs> I thought you'd be 39 forever. Yeah. I, You know what? I don't mind. I, I'm telling everybody my age because I, I want to not be ashamed of being old. In fact, I really like being old. It's nice being an old woman. There's a lot of stress off me. I, I totally agree. It's huh? nice. It is. It, there's a. I mean, I got my my education behind me. Um, I got a house and a husband and I, all the things that you know you want when you're young. You know, like money in the bank. Even the stock market's falling it doesn't matter. And um, got my. I got a great job. I've got great people around me. I mean, I I don't have to. I don't know. Just it's a good time. It's a, it's a freeing experience not to think I have to get a date. <laughs> growing <laughs> up, <laughs> growing older certainly is better than the alternative. Well, my sister died at 56. So that's the other thing is I, you know, I was in a flood when I was um, 20 and I watched my neighbor die. She drowned in front of me. And that was a wake up call for me to get my life together. And I did um, start on that road. But then my favorite cousin died within that same year. And my sister got her first diagnosis of cancer. So I really got my act together pretty quick. And um, and then she died at 56. So frankly, you know, I've always wanted to be healthy and and be able to do things and live my life a way that my sister and my mother and everybody else would have loved to see. So. Well, you've done amazing things. Yeah, thanks for the, thanks. Thank you for the um, nomination, by the way. Me? You. <laughs> <laughs> your point. <laughs> you. You you nominated me for the Lucent Brink. Yeah. That was an honor. That was a big honor. I had no I'd not imagined that would win that award. Well, Rob. Rich Rich did too, I think. So 
Rich did. I heard Rich did. Who else told me they, they nominated me? Um, I think Stewart did. A lot of something like nine or 10 nomina nominations, which was great. So I had nice people behind me and good people behind me. So I felt really great about it. But, you know, normally I would not have gotten it because I'm on the board. But they made an exception. <laughs> and I got it the year that, that Margie died, which meant a lot. And her sons were there to see me get it. So anyway, good stuff. So, and thank you for the gift once again, Frodo. It's, it was, I'm still eating those cookies. I decided that Fornum and Mason makes the best biscuits in the whole, in all the land. <laughs> but I can get back by. For the Hypertext Conference, are you stopping by London? I can't remember. I know you have to be in Amsterdam a bit, but. I got to be in Amsterdam. We're going to be 18 hours in Amsterdam. So we're staying um, near the hotel and we're taking a taxi in or train into the town. And I get to see the Anne Frank Museum, and the, I'm sure the guys are going to go do something else. <laughs> but I want to see the Anne Frank Museum very badly. She was always a hero of mine when I was a child. So. Yeah, that's... Uh... Have you seen it? No. I've been to Rob, Amsterdam have you twice, seen it? and I didn't do anything exciting on any level. Yeah. Or yeah, she was. Or I started. I read her when I was like in fourth grade, and I just I absolutely was mesmerized by her story and... Um, I've always wanted to see that museum, and I never had a time to stop in Amsterdam, but now I do. So, and they stay open till ten o'clock, so I have plenty of time to get there and maybe see something. Is and it he, the house that she was in? Yeah, um, it's a house that she was in. They turned it into a museum right on the waterfront. It's really supposed to be pretty. I've seen images of it. I've seen clips of it, but I've not been to it. I'm sure it'll be moving having read the story many times and taught it. I taught it in high school too. Wow. Anyway, so yeah, I won't be going through London, but I may be getting, I'm waiting to hear if I get accepted for a really cool conference in London in April. And then um, what else? Yeah, and then of course we may be at Hypertext in London next year. Oh. Well, Do you know it, where it's going to be? I think, well, uh, oh, Hypertext. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about us. No, Hypertext. It's, it's supposed to be in London. I, Sam Brooker is supposed to be the uh, potential host. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. That'll be very interesting. Uh, if you're yeah. if you're here, that would be I would I would really enjoy that. Not that there was anything wrong with Rome. Uh, um, so yeah, I wanted to mention um, last week I had a meeting with my brother and a producer. They were mm -hmm. going to do some um, stereo filming just like you can do with the iPhone to view on the headsets of artistic things in London, a mm -hmm. big project. It turns out that the um, producer and me didn't get along very well. Um, I would say this, that, and the other, but it was just a little weird. But during that meeting, the second meeting, I um, sent an email to Stephen Fry asking if he could be the lead celebrity for us. So if he could read a poem that we could then film in situ and that would really help this project get a lot and get it off the ground. And when it didn't, I felt a bit stupid having asked him a favor and then having to renege on it because he's obviously very busy. And he'd already said he couldn't do it in situ. He doesn't have time to go to places, but he agreed to do it from home. And I said, yeah, it would be fine. So I gave him uh, Doug Engelbart's kind of poem. It was on the first page of my thesis to read, and he did. I just give you the link here so you can get a sense of it. Why don't you play it for us? I I, I, I didn't have a chance to, to watch it this morning yet. Oh. But why don't you play it for us? Uh, yeah, if you click, if you all click the link and mute, then you get local sound. It's a minute long, so please feel free to do that. That might be a, a good idea. Um, um, just just to tell you, it's not prefaced by anything. It's literally Doug's statement. So uh, Danny and me would also say something, uh, and you know, to to couch it. So he would be quoted in there somehow, video wise. I don't know how that would be, but. This is what we have so far. So if you click on the link in the chat, you can see it. Right, that means I need to uh, mute here. Uh, have you seen it, Rob? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm gonna mute you as well then, so you can play it whatever volume you want.
His room is a little messy. <laughs> Characterful, yes. Of course, it would be better if he was kind of standing and more straight on, absolutely. But uh, watching it in the headset today, which I tested, the video on YouTube uh, that is not for sharing, obviously, is um, played flat and small, you know, it's just 720 is not very high quality on purpose. I could upload it for you guys now. But it's a good, uh, good PC he's reading, right? It's relevant to what we do. Yes, I mean, it's Doug Engelbart, right? We love Doug. Everything he does is great. So, perfect. So I was thinking, that I'm glad to hear that, Dini, of course, and not surprised based on what you've said, obviously, but I was wondering if maybe, first of all, you and me obviously need to speak in the introduction really briefly, right? Just very briefly. And then at the end, maybe we should have someone else do a epilogue, but also video. Maybe someone from humanities rather than the technical side to kind of balance it. What do you think? Well, let me say this. If it's going to be a book that we're involved in and I, I'm going to put it on my resume and, and promote it as a work coming out of this project, I'd want more than just a brief introduction. I'd want to make a full-fledged like academic book introduction where we inter talk about different, like how we group the, you know, what, what you know, Who's who's writing? What they're saying? Why it's important? And so yes. I do. Um, I do want to do that. I wouldn't want a small little introduction. And I'm happy to to write it and let you add to it. Well, as a co-publisher and editor, of course, uh, you can write anything you like for the introduction. You know that's a given. I'm wondering though of our spoken bits, how long that should be. Maybe it is a good idea to do a proper long spoken intro. Maybe it's too long because you're watching the headset. I just don't know. But for you to express clearly what this is, absolutely no question about that. I wouldn't have us reading a, a long introduction. I would have a, I do what I did for the book that we did in the lab, the Go With the Challenges book that Marius and I did. So Marius and I had a very long introduction, right? Typical academic introduction. But the video that we produce for the the multimedia book was a small clip of us talking. We condensed it into the basic, like an abstract, a one page per C. So the one page per C is the video of us talking, but the actual written document is longer. And that goes, that follows in what we were talking about several weeks ago about different audiences and different types of communication. The last thing people want is a long talking head video. Yeah, I agree on all of that. And I look forward to us sketching and deciding what to put in. And also, if you want to have another person for an epilogue, that would be great. Now, all of us here have access to the headset. So um, just want to highlight a few interesting things recently. The Gucci app is highly recommended you download. It's basically a video shown in a frame, but every once in a while, the environment you are in will change. So to me, it brings back like the early iPad days when we had really cool iPad apps and iPad cartoon reading and all of that stuff. It's not rocket science, but I really think it goes some way to present a multimedia experience based on video. So I highly recommend you all have a look at the Gucci app. It is free because it's obviously basically advertising. The Balenciaga one just doesn't work. Uh, at least we're using, our, we're using Gucci in our program, so we're teaching it to the students. Gucci, the fashion brand? No, we're teaching that that AI system in our classes. What, what AI system? There's I, one I was, called Gucci. I was referring to Gucci, the fashion brand. Oh, no. I'm talking about Gucci. There's a... Um, AI app, design app. Oh, can you put the name? Is it written? Is it spelled the same way? I'll pull it up and, and drop it in the chat. Thank you. That's interesting. But yeah, I highly recommend you. Obviously, you also need to do the polycam or whatever uh, if you haven't already done so. Have you, done, have you looked at it yet? Polycam? Uh -uh. Uh, the one we talked about last week. Yeah, polycam. Yeah, I got I got it on my I got it on my uh, my my app. Mobile phone. Yes, but have you yeah. tried it on the headset? No, it's, I haven't. It's really a revelation. Uh, um, it's really, really impressive. And it's a different, 
level of 3D. So um, Mark may join us. He text, he put one thing in Slack and one thing in a text. So we'll see if he's able to join us. But uh, I think if we don't, if you guys don't mind, um, can we talk a little bit about LaTeX? Do any yeah, of it's interesting that you said that because I, after all the work to get the uh, article, our article submitted to TAPS, which Mark did, I got a message saying LaTeX error detected. <laughs> So from TAPS, it's not done properly. And my image is missing. So uh. so what I'm building now is export from author to LaTeX. Okay. So all of these things should be automatic and go away very soon. And because we can do that, we're also going to do markdown. And I'm wondering how that relates to what we're doing with Sloan in terms of export options. Because uh, if you export from LaTeX, you have to put it into something like Overleaf because it's all template based. So I wonder if there are any thoughts on that. Well, anything we do like that is extra. We didn't promise them export ability, right? We, so I think anything we give them is going to be lanyap, as we say in New Orleans, extra, something I'm, special. I'm thinking more on the import side because uh, one thing that I've realized is because we can now soon export into LaTeX from author, which means you just write your normal stuff. That means that we can have, we can also go on the other side and we can build a LaTeX template based on ACM that includes all the metadata because it's already there. Mm -hmm. The LaTeX is a typesetting language. Yeah. It's really something at some point we could maybe extend into XR environments because it's it has more layout information than html obviously css changes that but you know what i mean i don't know just just wanted to mention how cool is that you can write an academic article in author click three buttons it's in latex and you say hi acm and you're done mm -hmm. huh i don't believe anything's going to be easy for acm <laughs> Ever. And as soon as we get, I'm going to say this to you, as soon as we knock this through the ballpark like that, they're going to change it again. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter. The, the principle is they can change their template as much as they like, but they cannot change the LaTeX language. You now that is outside of their control. So instead no, of- No, they may, they may drop LaTeX and pick up something more obscure. Well, I, I'm, I'm really- <laughs> I'm so mad at them, I can spit. I'm gonna say this, I never wanna write another essay for, for them again. I mean, poor Mark has been holding my hand through this whole process and it's still not right. And he he's the he's the TAPS king. <laughs> and Andrew, I'm missing a, a, a um, image. That's this one right here and we had it. Well, TAPS is but obviously different from LaTeX. When you made for me. Can you read, can you drop that into our chat if you find it? It should should still be in Slack, but I'll, I'll go dig it up if it's what I think it is. Is that the visualization, like all the, the text and some lines? Yeah, okay. from a long I'll, I'll time ago. <laughs> yeah, I don't have it saved locally, but I think it's still in Slack. Okay. But, but Dini, I am also unhappy with the complexities of LaTeX and ACM because I think it's a huge barrier for people that don't have access to a Mark Anderson in their circle of friends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So how do you not think it is super cool to completely remove, you just paste it in and it works? Yeah, I think it's cool. I just think that we have to train people to do it. They, I mean, not everybody's going to have access to what we're, what we have. What do you mean? What we have? Well, isn't this isn't this for our project? I'm currently doing it in author, so that's. But that means everybody's going to have to use author then. What you're what you're suggesting then is that we convert people from Word to author, which is your software program, right? That is that is my mission. I want to sell more of my software, absolutely, and that is what I'm doing this for. But I'm realizing that when the process of creating LaTeX, it can be so automated, it may be appropriate to use in other situations such as Sloan. I'm not saying we should do that now. We're not even authoring now. But um, yes, I am suggesting that more people should use my software if I can make it useful enough, which is why I put together a survey 
which of course I'll send to you guys, asking some questions about word processing and writing preferences to find out what people really want. Because I've had too many people complain to me that it doesn't support LaTeX or Markdown, so we're doing both. But it's also it's not just a commercial uh, benefit for me, Dini. It, it's also a matter of these are things that can be made automatic. If we can do it, shouldn't that inspire other software vendors to do the same? Yeah, I do. I think the problem with authors, you can't use images. I mean, yes, there's things. Of course you can. You just drop them right in. Okay. It, right. doesn't, it, does, it doesn't deal with images really well. That's something I'm looking into how to change. Can't si you can't size them, right? I mean, that, there's a problem. I tried using it, and I couldn't manipulate the images in author. I thought maybe I was doing it wrong, so maybe I'm not. I don't know. You cannot size them. That's completely right. Author is based on writing and having the images and export. But when you put images in to use them at, with a LaTeX export, the images will be fitting whatever template the LaTeX is. And similarly with PDF, it'll fit, you know, the, the framing of the PDF. Is there anything specific, Dini, you would like to go through today? Actually, I wanted to see what you, we already did. The one thing I wanted you to show um, um, Stephen Fry's video for us. And you also, that video that you linked um, I watched it. I'm going to use it in my class, but I'm going to say, I didn't write this into the, into the chat, but I'll say into Slack. But I think what's interesting about that video I about steps it. for spatial design. Okay. The problem I had with it, because I've watched it twice now, it's about 15 minutes long. We never see the final product. And when you do a demo, you would want to say, here's what you're going to be making. This is what, here's the final, pro here's what it is that you're going to make. Now, let me show you how to make it. We're going to do it in five or seven or 10 steps. And you show the seven and you list the steps. And then you go into step one, step two, step three. And at the end, you show it again and say, here's what we made. And so I never, ever got a sense of what we made through that entire process. Okay. That said, I think, I think it's a really good discussion of process. It was a year ago, so vision didn't exist then. So I think there's a lot of guesswork and a lot of speculation in that video. Oh, that's a beautiful, Andrew, I see in Slack here the image you sent to Dini. That's completely meaningless and very beautiful. Meaning that's the one we put in our article that you approved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the re Absolutely. resolution's a little low, but. No, but I'm not but saying it in a bad way. It, it really illustrates the notion of connection, but it isn't exactly the way it is now. So when I said meaningless, it wasn't in any way criticism. That is very, very cool. Where did you put it in our, um, where did you drop it? I, I just dropped it in a uh, sort of the, the small group me. chat with um Dini you Frode and Mark I, I think I thought that was like the writing group so I just put it in there oh okay sorry okay yeah we'll go back there then yep there it is okay yeah that's the one okay thank you for that great thank you so much I'll figure out what the other problem is <laughs> with our article the latex problem so to use your, your brains a little bit more then, and I, I don't mind if we finish early today, considering it's just the four of us, but um, particularly starting with you then, Dini, in addition to more control over sizing of images, what are the things that you consider really important in a word processor? Not necessarily author pages of Word or whatever, but what you not care about and what you really care about. Well, there's compatibility issues, right? So I want to go on record saying that I despise Microsoft. I hate Outlook. I used to use Pages a lot because you can go back and forth to Word. People send me, so here's the problem. People, the university has made Word our major work system. 
I have to create in Word, and I either send the doc in as a Word doc or it's a PDF from the Word doc. That's the workflow for my, my university. I'm supposed to answer all email in Outlook. Outlook works well with Word and PDFs and all that stuff. So it's supposed to be this kind of seamless experience. That said, we have problems with it, right? Because it goes down and all kinds of university systems go down and it ruins everything. But before I was using um, Word, I was using um, other Apple products. I used... Um, what was it? What's it called? Uh, oh my God! What was the what was the software program Apple had? MacWrite. Well, I used MacWrite, but it came after that, and then it disappeared. Uh, got bought out and, and discontinued. You mean Claris? Claris, Claris Works. Yeah, I used Claris Works, which was fine. And then I had to switch to Word because that became like the the mandatory system for most universities I've ever worked at. So that compatibility with all the rest of the system, being able to go back and forth, people be able to open it. John doesn't use Word. He sends me things in pages, which is great, but I can't, um, I mean, I have to convert those sometimes when I'm at school into Word docs and then all the form formatting goes wonky. So there's, there's some real problem. I think we're, I don't know. I just think it's, I just want a I just want a system like just write in and I can drop my images in, I can size them, I can put captions on them. I mean, I literally did this yesterday with my syllabus. Yeah. Why do you want to size images in the writing program? Can I show you? I'd be glad to answer that question. One second. By the way, Andrew, while well, she's getting that up, how are you doing for Wednesday? Will we have a, a test? Um, I'm not really sure because I had a test last Wednesday, uh, but I've only had one day to work on it since then. So, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'll have a better sense later. Um, I could try to still get a test, even if it's kind of broken. Um, but yeah, just considering where I'm at, I think getting everything tied together uh, and connected enough to let people demo is going to be kind of a 50-50 for this week. I think you should, uh, I'm sure Danny would agree. Tell me if you don't, Danny. I think you should not prioritize demo for us right now. Prioritize okay. what you need to do, and um, then we will look for a schedule. Um, yeah, we don't want if, to do it just for the heck of it. Yeah, if it works out, I'll, I'll push the demo for sure. Okay, I want to show you my syllabus. Hang on one second. Let me drop it into our Zoom chat. It is still, I'm still finalizing guest speakers. I just got um, Randall to agree to come and talk about his demo to my students. So he, he agreed to come, but not as an Apple person, but as a feature of text person. So if you open up that uh, syllabus. I will, it's just Microsoft Word takes about 10 minutes to open on this machine. Hang on, it's, it's trying. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't doubt that. Okay. And Andrew, this is coming out of the meetings that you and I had with Aaron. There's still, I still want to run it by you and Aaron to get final input. But this is what I finished this weekend. I worked really hard on this for the past week. So if you, if you scroll down to the actual schedule, part three, course schedule. Where's my pictures? Wait a minute. Where's my pictures? Oh, that's the wrong one. Hang on. I sorry, wrong one. Damn it. That's the senior seminar. I did that one too. So you're talking about being able to highlight and color code text, right? Yeah, hang on a second. Where'd it go? Yes. Yeah. See that's right there. Try that. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, that's the one. So what I try to do in my with this particular with these special topics courses, I try to make it a little more interesting visually. So I start off with the course information requirements, information about that. And I have the picture of the Apple Vision Pro right there with the caption. 
I sized it to fit. There's an image there of Shar Davies and her VR rig from 2002. If you scroll down, you can see some other images. There's the cave at Brown University. Figure four is Linguamu, the first kind of one of the first uh, Moo environments. Future of Text and XR, there's a photo from, I was looking for the one that you and I did, Andrew, for the article, so it was missing. I'll drop that in here instead. And then here is uh, the VR environment from the Shard. The guy that whose company made that is one of the speakers I've invited to come to class, which is cool. That's Toby Roberts. And then Beat Saber, <laughs> Andrew Beat Saber. <laughs> and then the dead Mozilla Hubs, which is just goofy. <laughs> but there's a picture of Mozilla Hubs. But I tried to get the students to, to be like, it's like visual interest. And then I highlight things like, you know, you can see I highlight things in color. If it's going to be due, it's in blue. Green is, they should be paying attention. Yellow, I'm just, it's the note to me, like, is he still coming? Um, will real world come also? We're going to be watching Tron together on a Friday night for special extra credit. That's in pink. So, um, so that's the special computing course that I'm working with with Andrew. Andrew, I've been working really hard on this, darling. <laughs> and reading lots of books. I got a pile here. Hi, Mark. Thanks for coming. I didn't think you're going to be here, friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. I'm dealing with some absolutely spectacular incompetence at the ACM at the moment. But you think? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's just frustrating. It's a uh, it's sort of it's that kind of thing that people take undue comfort in the few things that work and all the things that don't are all the sort of well I you know I I did my personal best so it can't be my problem um can't you sort it out and I'm thinking <laughs> okay <laughs> that's not the authors that's the people the other end see it's, it's always sad you know when you put something in, you get a sort of passive and aggressive message back saying your thing has failed with no actual information as to what you can do to fix it. Because everyone's trying quite hard. You know, people want to get published. Anywho, I shouldn't dwell on it. Well, notice I got a back, I got a notice back from, from uh, ACM that taps found an error in, in, in the uh, upload. There's missing an image and there's some problems with it. So I'm gonna... I'll, I'll take a look at it when we're done, yeah. I got an image though, and the image was missing. So I looked at the the zip file, and it was not in there. So oh, and oh just okay, dug it up out of the dead. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. That shouldn't be, yeah, you know, odd. Mark, <laughs> Mark, I, I got another paper maybe to do. That's the human workshop one. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, the, the, the thing is. These things aren't complicated. The, the, the problem is that the problem mainly is, especially for people who are writing words, somebody they basically somebody got hired to write a, a word document, clearly never tested it. They then wrote some instructions that they clearly never got anyone to test who hadn't used it before. So there's this conversation I had with people saying, would you do this? I said, well, that's not what you get. I think I bottomed it out that actually something installs a hold of things you can't see unless you massively resize a window, but you would never know if it wasn't there. And for the sake of actually bothering to read the instructions they'd written, you know, that's three weeks of sort of, you know, general embuggerance for everyone. But it just, it just shows. I, I'm always amazed when people write essentially process documentation that it is in a mandatory sort of sign off that it has to have been looked at by someone who has no exposure to the thing being described because once you know how something works it's actually incredibly hard to to, to write all the things that uh, are unguessable but you don't mention because you're so used to doing it that you you just you you see it happening in your mind's eye you forget to mention that actually you know to open the door you've got to wiggle the handle slightly you know you think they're going and staying in a sort of bnb or something all those helpful notes that people leave you you know the garage door is difficult to open sort of thing anywho uh, good to see brandon brandon good morning 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 um yeah so uh, as i was just um mentioning earlier i'm glad uh, mark and brandon are here now just wanted to say that um 
not everybody has access to Mark Anderson's expertise. So we have now started building LaTeX export from author, uh, which is going really well, surprisingly well. And the first issue came up today, which I think is very fascinating. And that is the headline abstract through an error. But that is, of course, because LaTeX treats abstract as a special object. And that is exactly the sort of thing we need to do when we go through this. So I'm really excited about this for two reasons. And um, this is just an author, my own commercial software, but I'm hoping that we do this, others can have. I'm happy to share the code. But it, it, it does two things. Number one, if it works well, a user who understands the basics of LaTeX will be able to copy and paste into the LaTeX template and they're done. If there are any rendering errors, you see it in Overleaf or equivalent, you go back, author, you fix it, you paste again. That's going to remove a lot of headaches. But the other side that I think is so interesting, uh, we can start playing with uh, LaTeX templates. One thing we talked about last week, I thought most of you were here. Oh yeah, Mark, you weren't here, unfortunately, is uh, we could imagine making a, a LaTeX template to print to a huge sheet. So when you read it in XR, you're looking at a massive image, not a little sheet, but it's rendered with layout for that reading. That could be fun. Of course, three-dimensional interactivity is important, but also the basic reading, as Brandel has shown many times, for having simple text in a beautiful way and a simple background in, in, in this. But then also, I realized only today that a LaTeX document has all the, basically all the visual meta stuff already there, including the headings, including the self-citation, including the references, all of that good stuff. So it should be trivial to produce a perfect LaTeX template that when given to ACM or whoever, as in a plugin for that, will include at the end of the document in whatever branding format they have, two things. One, copy this line of tiny text as a bib tag if you want to cite the document. And below this is all kinds of other stuff that you may want to use or your AI later. So going from kind of hating LaTeX because of the complexity, uh, as long as a lot of it's automated, it may give us a lot of power. And I'm hoping also as a nicer way to smuggle things into XR. Because it encodes meaning. It's good, isn't it? It's possible that it includes meaning. Uh, my, uh, my, my knowledge of using HTML for the last um, tw 29 years um, uh, is that uh, it also has the ability to convey meaning uh, and many people fall wildly short of that mark because they are thinking in a presentational way. So uh, it, it's a possibility that people manage to keep LaTeX more honest. Uh, I would be I would be incredibly curious to see what the 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 realistic sort of uh, use case of LaTeX is, in so far as it sort of retains its semantic meaning versus uh, having been used for uh, sort of presentational purposes. Before Mark says authoritatively, I will say that it seems that LaTeX is really bitchy. It just won't let you put in nonsense. So the, the thing that we had today, the first real bug, which was fascinating, I had a heading abstract. When I went into Overleaf, it threw an error. So my programmer was like, what the heck? Why isn't this working? I was like, oh, because abstract is a unit of meaning in LaTeX. So you have to wrap it with this, that, and the other. So it puts much stronger demands on the data than HTML does, which is partly why HTML is widely successful. I, I, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoyed at the thought of that someone is going to write LaTeX templates. It uh, turns out to be rather difficult. Um, <laughs> it's lovely. Much of it's written in a language that people gleefully describe as never having been documented. It's a sort of push-pull system. Um, and the only way I did the work I did last autumn was literally to black box the whole thing. You put a penny in this slot and see what comes out the other end. Rinse and repeat for just days and days on end, because that's the only way to make sense of it. But, you know, I, I think it's all doable. Um, and you're right. I mean, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that, like lots of other things, um, P, uh, LaTeX was essentially written. What, one, of the, one of the marvels it did was uh, A, dealing with things like um, mathematical formulae, which are just problematic generally to print, and also um, 
basically doing good typography without you having to be a typographer. So it does very tight print packing, justification, all sorts of clever stuff, you know, moving things around so you, you get a good packing. That's marvellous. But it is, at its heart, designed for print. And, of course, every time we use it for something else, we're stepping away from that. It's, um, it's error messages I think you could describe as anomic. They're, they're, really, <laughs> they're really not <laughs> particularly useful. They basically say, you have failed. <laughs> and then uh, and, and, and often that means you get nothing. So render, 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 then nothing. And then until four hours later, it all comes back again, and you still don't know what you changed. But broadly, as you hone in, I mean, once it's done, it, it, it's, it's wonderful. And you can, you can easily actually change the presentation too. So, for instance, in the case of the ECM templates, they want you to, for peer review, you just change one line, and it turns up as one column with line numbers and all doodads and, you know, no author information. Change one line of code, and it all turns out in its final presentation format. So that kind of thing's really useful. And in fact you would be able to uh, think about issues like uh, if you wanted a, when you say a big page, I presume that what you're trying to do is type, literally typeset a big page in a, for a virtual environment. So we're still making paper in digital form. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, yeah, because essentially you just set the, you set, you would set the size. Um, if you want, I mean, I don't know that it requires much, much difference. It's, it's either, you know, between, because to a certain extent, you could just uh, scale a page. No, no, because no, no, no. You, you want to embiggen the text to a degree, otherwise you can read it. Well, on that particular topic, I am thinking, I might, I'm not mute to you, you can hear me, right? Yeah, good. Um, I'm thinking, so I think I showed a few of you this last week. I bought this book because it's so damn beautiful. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's about different thinkers and stuff, right? But look at this. Oh my gosh, you have a huge type thing on here. And then randomly on another page, you know, wow, right? I, I love these things. And they can be very readable. I remember, especially in the 90s, you could buy these really huge magazines. They don't fit well on a desk. So I'm just thinking if we could print to a virtual thing, and of course, interactivity 3D, of course, all that has to happen. But even to just sit back on your sofa, and by the way, one thing I've discovered that's really fascinating, I have range anxiety. I tend to use this near my laptop or at my desk. When I decide to unplug it and sit on a sofa, it becomes a completely different thing. So that's where I've been in reader, reading these huge things. So the, the point is, sorry, I'm thinking too many things there. Normal size text, so it shouldn't scale with it. It shouldn't be a small page made big. But uh, also, Brandon, last week, one of the things we, we were thinking about for our own book, The Future of Text, rather than what we're doing here with Sloan, is to release it in a way that it has built in um, Brandle Bobhorn murals. We talked about it before. So it, it kind of goes into this thing of just using the size, partly. Now, before I hand over, just really, really briefly, on uh, the maths and printing things that uh, Mark was talking about, one of the things I'm doing with the author export to LaTeX is that if you used maths or some or graph program or whatever that produces LaTeX that's really specialist, copy that LaTeX, paste it into author, it pastes it as code. So when you then export, it's exported yeah. as that. Author doesn't try to do any rendering of it. So that means you can have perfect maths easily done. It should also mean that we can do XR stuff whatever it might be, basically encoded for different uses coming out of it, right? Um, and finally, just wanted to say, um, Stephen Fry has recorded a nice little spatial video for us. We also want to use for our book, not Sloan, but the book. You open it up, you can view this thing. Um, I'm hoping this can be a bit of an impetus for us to do more different kind of media in the book. Uh, Fabian will be working on some of that and we'll see where it goes to. Yeah, that was a lot. Dini, thank you. I want to circle back and talk about meaning automatically involved in coding and that kind of thing in latex. You have to be intentional, right? All writing is intentional if you want to convey some sort of meaning. Gobbledygook might, you can make meaning out of it, but it's not necessarily intentional. There's some really interesting um, experiments with this by artists, right? And so I paste it in here, Jim Andrews' Enigman which is really fabulous work. And you read it at the front end and at the top end of the image and things are happening. But then you read the code and inside the code, he's telling you 
the story, right? So the real part of the real part of the work is reading both ends, the back and the front, putting it together. That's one example. There's so many of these. Um, Dina Larson, Margie Lusenbrink, um, a lot of authors were using different affordances of the code, the web, browser, to, to kind of tell a, mega, a meta story around the actual story to actually imbue meaning. And I think about uh, Dina Larson's use of the, um, like when you make a hypertext in story space, you can name the paths and she would name the paths and there'd be a story in the path. So if you're reading samplers, for example, one of the little poems and samplers, there's a story within the story. And so there's all these little things that artists have been doing to show that that code does not automatically have meaning in the sense of narrative, right? It can if you look for it really hard and put it in there, but it's not in it's not in it's not indigenous to it. So um yeah, so I think it's an interesting argument. Semantic markup we're using in the lab so that it, <clears throat> the computer reads, the, the, the machine technology can read the, the, the work, the website, so that somebody that can't see can hear it. So there's things we've been doing to kind of imbue more information in a web environment so that people can get more meaning out of it. But it doesn't just hold meaning like we think of meaning. That is very, very, very important. Very important. We shouldn't just be all of the one way of communicating, one way of thinking. Uh, I mentioned also last week, Rory Stewart, um, British politician, scientist person has a series of podcasts on ignorance, the importance of ignorance. And it, it is not ignorance equals stupidity, of course. It goes quite a bit deeper than that. So the artistic um, side that Dean is talking about is if we ignore that, then we just, yeah, that's not good. On the uh, big pages uh, question or issue, um, it's interesting to think about the sort of the costs or the benefits of approaching it from a LaTeX perspective, because uh, it, to Mark's point, it is explicitly sort of um, single singly proportioned and singly presented um which has its benefits at times uh, actually in contrast to html which uh, in the modern day has uh, the responsive web and you know the the theory goes that um the sort of css media queries and other things like that give you the ability to uh present the same information uh in a way that's appropriate for a phone to a, an ipad to a to a big desktop computer but you, you can you can apply it adversarially and have functionally a completely different page uh, on one to the other, and uh, and that would be funny. I've never done it on purpose. Um, but uh, what it doesn't cover right now, and what is sort of intrinsic to something like a, a very large document, something that's too big to stand comfortably close to or sit com sit sit on your lap with, um, is that we have different orientations toward such a document or such an object. So um, I'm reminded uh, when I worked in Apple marketing, we used to print out every single design of every single website. Um, and we just have these galleys of them. And they were sometimes, so like the iPhone 7 page um, was 109,000 pixels tall. Um, it was probably our worst one in terms of uh, people failing to recognize that brevity is uh, a useful marketing tool. Um, but so that was, uh, it was like five vertical sheets of these things uh, st standing up side by side. But one of the things that it meant is that you had uh, tremendous continuity of being able to see things above and below and, and several scrolls away. And, uh, and so people would, would design for that. They would say like, no, we need to make sure that the gutter, like obviously, you know, left aligned, it's having a, a, a 16 up or whatever the, the grid size is, people use 12. Um, but they would want things up here and then 10 screens down to have symmetry. And 
it's a possibility that that's just kind of the special magic applesauce that makes things uh, wonderful, but it was also uh, sort of screaming out as an artifact that was 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 present because we were appraising the website in this way and literally no one else was doing it. If they were, then they were wasting a lot of paper. Um, and uh, and but but you know that that means that um, as we were designing and building and anticipating how how a website got to get built, um, we were we were seeing it in a way, and so th there was at some level, at least conversationally and socially, this this meta media query uh, of like a website needs to look like it's going to be a website needs to look like it's going to be a website when it's printed on a page from ten feet away. Um, <laughs> even though, and, and so, you know, we, we didn't write any CSS or HTML for that, but that was functionally one, one of the ad additional sort of design constraints where, you know, people say like a bridge, not only does it need to be a bridge, but it needs to stay up while you're building it. And uh, so this is one of those sort of additional constraints for a website at Apple is that it needs to stay up while it was uh, a document sort of from 10 feet away printed uh, uh, so that it was sort of seven feet tall. And, uh, and a foot and a half way. Um, and so one of the things that uh, merely making, so I, I'm in support either of a static or a dynamic document and the idea that people would sort of target an ungodly large sort of uh, visual viewport. Um, what I think is an important thing to figure out and uh, uh, right now, uh, all of our displays that we conceive of as being for a website presentation are meant to be viewed at, you know, three feet or less um, is how do you how do you convey that something's big but you're looking at it from far away uh, th that this is a that it has dimensions but the angular dimension perhaps is low because it's it's being viewed at a distance because that's not something that we've built the idea of a website as having as needing to have a representation of uh and uh, yeah, I actually need it for work. So if you could answer that, that'd be great. <laughs> I, can, I can comment on something immediately though. And that is, of, uh, and by the way, this is recorded and everything. So I'm not gonna say or ask too much, but uh, I'm a little surprised that apple.com is not special uh, when viewed in the Vision Pro. It seems like an amazing opportunity when you finally go to that website for it to be, wah, you know, church bells and everything. Um, but and when we're talking about our book, I am not saying um, LaTeX at all. I'm not saying PDF at all. I'm not saying web at all. Uh, what I am saying is that we really should have XR as being the primary version of the book. Mm -hmm. Anything else? See, yeah. See you later, Rob. Thank you. You're up. Very much for today. Bye. Um, that, so that, that's what I really strongly feel this this time around. There's no real excuse not to. Um, so uh, also on this specific issue. Sitting on the sofa, you know, interacting with this, rather than being afraid having a laptop screen in front of me, it's this really lovely thing. You sit back comfortably and you read and you have all this space and it's just beautiful. But to interact, you don't have to do the trying to get your eyeball in the right place and, and twitching like you're trying to kill a fly, which is great for many interactions, but selecting text, not so good. The really nice thing is the optimal reading distance is the same as the reach forward. So you can touch it. You know, so that difference is absolutely crazy. So, um, you know, I really think we need to start working on our book. As, yeah, uh, as soon as possible. How should we do it? Dini, dini, dini. I brought it. I brought in my iBook. I was reading some stuff on iBook, right? And I brought that into the Vision Pro and read off iBook, which is fine, right? It was a good experience. It was the same thing as reading it on an iPad, except larger, more immersive. So I don't see a difference necessarily in terms of what I can do with the text. It's just more there, more present, right? And so the yesterday I went to bar, I'm trying to get a copy of Meeting the Universe Halfway by Barad, which is a book about quantum mechanics and entanglement theory. Because I'm interested in the, in, the, in, the difference between in-person and remote experiences for people and trying to think about it in terms of quantum mechanics, because I think there's something they're um, involved in that. But anyway, so I went to Barnes and Nobles to buy the book and they didn't have it. It's on iBook, but I don't want to read that book in iBook. I really want to manipulate that book. I want to mark it up. I want to do things to it. I can't do an iBook. I mean, I can highlight, right? And I can, I can comment, 
but it's different than me taking the book and marking things up and annotating it. So I got home, ordered it from Amazon, damn it, <laughs> and it's coming this morning between 10 o'clock and noon. So I will have a copy of that book. But so the bottom line is at some point, I look at a book, I, I get a notice from my from my book, from Apple, that there's a, some books that I might be interested in. I go through and read it and I decide if it's a book that I'm going to keep and mark up or a book I'm just going to read for fun. If it's for fun, it stays in the iBook. If it's something I want to keep in my library and do something with, I go out and buy the book. So I have two libraries now I'm carrying around, or three actually, right? One iBook, one on my computer called the library of PDFs and things like that. And then the actual series of libraries I have in my house, and there's four of them based on different criteria. So I think that's something that's pretty getting to be pretty common for, for folks like me. Yeah, I mean, I completely feel similar and read similar. I don't read as much inside the, um, yeah, the iBooks app, but yes. But I just think we, we need to decide quite soon on how the future of text should be in XR, what technology to use to do what we want. And it, sh it, it, it should be amazing. Of course, a lot of that will come down to interactivity. And maybe we do it HTML and WebXR, you know, not necessarily both in both places, because one of the things that is amazing and was one of the first things we experienced in XR is the gosh darn Brandle mural. It's actually a little bit insane how good it is, because all it is is a massive sheet and you just move your hand and there it is. I mean, the technology with all loving respect to you, Brandle, isn't that high relative to like a flying adventure or whatever. But the utility is enormous, right? So if we can just somehow get our book in, in a relatively normal format, that whenever there is a either an image, a mural, or maybe the book itself re-rendered to do this, to, to pull it out of the page and to view it, size really matters with this, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it just the, the experience, it's like, um, yeah, sorry, I can waffle forever. Mark, please stop my waffling. Yeah, I was, I was um, j just thinking as, as, as you were sort of saying, you know, we really need to work out what we're going to do it in. I, I think we should be a bit kinder to ourselves because I think one of the things that really um, I've sort of picked up on here is, you know, in the last year of so doing this is, for want of a better term, how immature of the tools are. And that's not to be disrespectful of the people who've made them. A lot of work and skill has gone into that. But compared to some of the things that we have, you know, if you go into a, a sort of woodworking tool shop that have had many, many generations to evolve into their current finely home form. So I think it's always going to be a bit of a it's always going to be a bit of a trial at this point. And one of the interesting things, perhaps, is to keep it is is to just, you know, be pragmatic about there are things that we wanted to do that we we really can't yet. We sort of know we'd like to do this, but that's not quite where things are. But there are other things we can sort of do. Because the other thing is, until we actually, until these are made manifest, there's that sort of appalling thing. Well, it is the prototyping thing, isn't it? You slay for hours and hours and hours, you get something, all of a sudden, meh, onto the next, and you think, and half of you thinks, well, that was a complete waste of time. And actually, it wasn't, because if you never did it, you wouldn't know if it works or not. So you've got to get it to a certain stage of maturity just to decide whether it actually has um, legs. Or often the, the, there's a sort of serendipitous thing where you don't get what you want, but you get the insight of, a different approach to the thing that you the the the, the goal you're after but maybe started from a different place <laughs> so I, I mean i think it's all useful um and i just wrap that in saying that I, I you know i don't think we should sort of give ourselves too much angst about getting it right because i don't think we know what right is it's too early with this medium to really say that but lots of head shakes on that one um so uh, I have been arguing in fun ways with you guys over AI extraction of concepts, topics, keywords, and all of that over the last few weeks. And I was kind of challenged last week to um, go and do some of it in terms of making shapes. And I found that within the size of uh, proceedings, it truly isn't that useful. Mark, stop smiling. You are right. I know you weren't smiling, but I'm just referring to your earlier points. It is very well taken. I've been very, 
humbled by how crap it is, which is, of course, research, so that's fine. Um, but what I did do is make a new table of contents for our old book from last year based on AI extracted terms. So you can go to a page and find out um, where people are mentioned. So if you see Bruce Horn, you select Bruce Horn, do Command F, you see where Bruce is in the book. That kind of stuff was genuinely useful. So I think we're going to do that for this book properly. But um, we, we do need, we, we've kind of gone through it in many ways. And so now I think we're liberated by the fact that Andrew is working uh, on Sloan. We're liberated to look at what we want for our own book. So if we just look at what we want the user to be able to do, see, and feel in XR, the um, platform may present itself. Dini, please. And a lot of the academic books, scholarly books that I have, there's two two indexes. One, names of people in the book, and the other, concepts and ideas expressed in the book, right? And so uh, that trend began, I don't know, in the last 20 years, became very popular. And it's mainly because people want to see if they're in each other's books. <laughs> okay. That's my theory. Because I found that what people, what a lot of my friends do when they get a book, they say, oh, they forgot me. <laughs> what about my work, you know? And they, and they put that in, they used to put it in Twitter, right? Not so much anymore. And so it became kind of a joke. It's like, oh, so I'm not in your book, eh? You know? <laughs> what about my work? And so it became a really easy way for authors to show that they're citing everybody they need. It's also something that happens in graduate school because in PhD programs, you're, it's, a, it's a cheap and easy way for your committee to make sure you have cited all the right people. Right. They just go into the index and they go, OK, you got you got Engelbart, you got Nelson, you got you got jobs, you got all right, you got it, Mark. Right. Without them having to really do the heavy load. And I've seen dissertation committees like this a lot in my career. So it's something we're offering. Right. But it's it, it's not as useful as we would think, because it doesn't net us anything except Oh, I'm not in your book. Oh, I'm in here five times. <laughs> uh, and that kind of stuff. I, I, I actually, when I'm in a book, it's like, oh, so I'm in it for the same thing over and over and over again. And that information has been wrong for 20 years. <laughs> That's the other fun thing. They just keep pasting the wrong information. So we find that a lot in the lab. Uh, anyway, Mark, it's really brief. I, I, I'm going to show something. So Mark, please go ahead first. Uh well, just quickly, and that's to say that I, one thing I, I'm conscious that we've been sort of, well, it's been circling the drain for sort of about three editions of Future Text in a way is that when I think back to when, oh, sorry, I'm brain fault for names, but we were talking about the uh, highlighter tool and stuff. Um, the, the, the chicken egg problem we have is a lot of things we'd like to do actually depend on a lot of information we don't have. So really what it would be lovely to do is to have a lot of cross connection built between um, articles there. Um, the, the, the difficulty is the cross connections we want aren't going to necessarily surface just by doing sort of term recognition because that's not where the insight lies. It's about knowing that the person who's writing, I don't know about Aboriginal song lines is actually, there's a you know connection to something that might be a technical part of XR or something. And we sort of know that. Um, the difficulty is um, of course, we now have our ever ever growing body of um, of text in four volumes now, um, so it's not getting any smaller. And I still think it's a human scale job, but we don't have a human resource um, that's uh, allocated to that at the moment, because um, it needs to be somebody. Sort of, it needs to be done by somebody who wants to do it for a start. I don't think it's the kind of thing you can pay somebody to do specifically, because in a sense, if it's just a job. Um, they've got to get to the end, and they will be conscious of how far they are. They they are not through the system. Um, so it, it's a sort of difficult thing. But I, I do think that part of the richness that we're looking for in terms of the the sort of the visualization or the interconnectedness of the quite broad range of things that are in future of text will begin to shine if 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 we somehow manage to uh, address that elephant in the room. And the fact is, we don't have that metadata i don't want to call it keywords because everyone will reach for their favorite way of generating keywords and that's it's more subtle than that i guess it's the difference between a computer generated index and a human generated index the human generated index will be smaller more targeted 
-hmm. and much more expensive to make because uh, it calls it in calls a very different skill that you know mm -hmm. can't be run at can't be run at, at, at volume but uh, i think it's worth us holding on to that gap because i think that's something useful um that really could be built off the of that so if anyone knows some you know or someone who's an early stage looking at these sort of things and wants a challenge to take on i think it's i think it's quite a genuine uh, interesting thing to do thanks can i respond to that um uh, frodo really quickly one of the things that i'd like uh, uh, one of the things i try to do is that when i read a book is if it's a book that i really know i'm going to use quite a bit like when i got kate hales's writing machines i knew that was going to be a seminal text for me and so I outline the book, I read it several times, I mark it up really well, and then I can tell you exactly what page number things show up on. I don't have to look at the book anymore, right? So the eidetic memory comes into play. And that and and because of that, I, I feel like I know the book really well. And if someone says, Oh, she says this, and I'm no, no, on page 29, she actually says blah, blah, blah. I can I I can point to the text in my head. And be able to argue back and, and make points about the book, right? So I think there's something to be said about human interaction with the book. It helps us know the work so well. And people with eidetic memories, especially, I don't get that same memory bank if I'm using the tools to do that, right? And the same, I just finish up this thought, when I'm teaching, when I meet the students in my class the first day of school, I can usually, and, and Andrew can verify this, I usually know their names after the first week easily. I remember their names well, and I usually associate it with their hair. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah, so there's things that, that people with good memories do so that I can get to know people well. Because once somebody knows that you know their name, they feel like that you care about them. You establish a better rapport and connection with them and students need you need that kind of relationship with your students to be able to get them to trust you to educate them Does that makes sense so on the one hand i think there's some value in ai and, and letting it pull this stuff out and i'm i'm all for that but on, on the other hand for my own personal needs i i rely on my own labor i guess one more thing i'll say and i'll stop when i was doing my dissertation on um on the odyssey with my colleague, um, she and I had gone through the Odyssey that divided it into 12 books, 12, you know, one through 12, 13 to 24. And we went through and circled every adjective or descriptor used for Odysseus, Penelope, Telemachus, and um, Athena, every one of them. And we marked it on a piece of paper and put the citation next to it. And we began to develop this theory that was different than ever, than anyone had ever thought of before on the notion of of, of, of um, uh, the word gain, the word gain in English, kernos in Greek. And um, we took it to the professor and he said, oh, there's nothing you can do that's different than anybody's done in a thousands of years. So you're, you're just a measly graduate student, <laughs> forget it. At the same time, Mark, this is interesting because Pandora, was a word search program that sat on top of um, Perseus. And Perseus had just been released on CD. And University of Texas at Austin had a copy. And I had a copy of Pandora. I bought a copy, $25. And I drove up to Austin. They let me put Pandora on the computer. And Mindy and I together did the word search with the, with the Odyssey, right, in the Greek, and found that we didn't miss a word. Everything we did by hand. That said, I remembered everything I did by hand and didn't pay attention to anything the computer did for me, except just verify the information. So then we were able to go back to the professor and argue back with him. And he then believed the machine, which I found in interesting. He didn't believe us until the machine verified it. And then he began teaching it in his classes and taking credit for it. <laughs> and she caught him. <laughs> Yeah, to walk it back. Anyway, so yeah, we published on it. Mark Bernstein published the article for us, Mark. 1993, I think it was 94, something like that. But there's something about the machine that helps people understand, oh, this is really important because humans can't do this themselves. It's like, you know, <laughs> not really. <laughs>
in the uh, podcast that I linked to up there, they do actually talk about the Greek ancient definition of curios. Sorry, the word, the Greek word, not the modern one, and the difference, uh, which is interesting, Dini. Um, Kurdos. Hmm? Kurdos. Kurdos, yes, thank you. Kurdos. Uh, also, I, I think it is very, very clear, and I think this is the central irony of interaction design, that if you have to do it yourself, you understand it better. There, there's, there's no question of that uh, in my mind. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys, so it's not too abstract, before I hand over to Brandel. This is what I got out of the book. So under, I'm not going to go through every detail, but under the category where the AI decided it was philosophical, it lists and has the author's name in brackets. The author's name turned out to be useful. If it was just the title, it's a bit bare, it seemed to me. Um, I did this, I did also technological and technical. Of course, those should have been combined, but this is an experiment to see what the raw output was. Then it goes into historical, and there was very little historical that it found, but it's nice. It says that Libya's article was historical. You should think so, it's from Sumeria. Um, and then it went through people mentioned, and it generated a brief bio for each one of them. So if you have a look at this, it's not perfect, but I would say it's a really good start for a human editor. What do you think? Well, my bio is incorrect. Um, in AI, at least chat GPT tells me that I went to Berkeley for my PhD. Instead yeah. of UT Dallas, yeah, but, so but, but I look it, cooler. <laughs> but it does find things. I mean, if you look at this, doesn't this look like a good place to start editing? Editing, yes. Yeah. That's I mean, the point. I mean, this is the point that I think we've been making is it start, let it pull out data, but the but the human inter intervention is, is required, even yeah, now. Absolutely. I think we're all in complete agreement on that. So here it is uh, under other, it's got some surprising ones that it didn't categorize, but that's okay, easy for us to do. It also found uh, people who just aren't that relevant, who should probably be deleted. Uh, and then it went through the authors and um, generated summaries based on what they had written. So um, let's see, Mark Bernstein explores the future of text within the virtual and augmented reality context, drawing comparisons with historical and fictional representations of text and screens. That's kind of cool, uh, et cetera. And, Can I uh, mention something about that? So go back to that page. What's interesting is it, it's a boring writer. It repeats, contributes, and explores all the way down. And what would be better is just drop the verb entirely and go straight into the multiple pieces discussing. I, I agree I mean, with it, you. But... It, that's where the human intervention comes in because we teach in our classes in technical writing that you don't want to repeat the same action verb all the way through a bullet or a list. I agree very much. And that's one of the key problems I have with AI summaries. It always starts with this article or this person. I've tried different prompts to get it to drop that. But again, I agree very much. It needs a human to cut those things down, but you don't have to do it from scratch. And then we get into uh, who had uh, BR as a keyword. I think this is quite useful. Uh, where was AI discussed? Uh, then we get to uh, some people and yeah, uh, places, very few places, so didn't do a good job here. Uh, and then interestingly, likely audiences for the different articles. So researchers may like this and this, educators may like this and this, this is where I feel personally it's getting too speculative. I don't think it's right. I don't think we should use that one. And then finally, a list of concepts introduced, which are clearly concepts like severability. Oh, where was that? That was uh, by, yeah, anyway, so we have um, 500 pages here. And I've obviously messed it up by, oh no, this is just the beginning one. It doesn't have the, 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 the text. Anyway, I just I would recommend. To I was going to say, well, I would recommend really quickly that um, if we did something like this, we'd give it back to the author and let them edit and make sure they approve of what the AI is telling other folks about that, their work, don't you think? I think that may be the most powerful use of this, because instead of telling authors to give us summaries and keywords, which they never do, this gives them something to edit, which is a huge reduction yeah. in workload. I'm going to turn off the camera for a second, but I can't hear you, Randall. Cool. Uh, so what I wanted to say uh, was from before this video, but dovetails with 
some observations about it as well. Um, and that is that um, uh, Dina, you were talking about having uh, read in Vision Pro and it being entirely adequate um, in terms of you know having the space in my books and stuff like that. Um, and something that I've been thinking about because I I read um, uh, Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media just uh, in Safari and Vision Pro uh, earlier this year, and uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I think that there are ways of arranging it. Actually, um, in another call, I'm in, uh, some of the folks have um, a good relationship with Andrew McLuhan, the grandson of Marshall, and uh, so he has some interesting sort of observations from Eric, uh, his father, uh, Marshall's son, who actually worked with him and. Uh, and so, the, you know, the idea that actually the first seven chapters are a syllabus, but the next 25 are actually just um, sort of a, an assorted selection of poetry, functionally, uh, that, that were sort of included and excluded largely at the whims of, of what folks felt like felt fit better on the, on the day, you know, a final publication. So mm -hmm. I feel like that, that lends credence to the kind of the structure of how I want to present it uh, at some point in the future. But, um, uh, you know, the approximately like the the process of reading is relatively well um suited to the medium as we have it today in terms of just being able to display it big but when you want to do something more serious more intentional and more opinionated as Dani does once she's made the commitment to a physical tangible book that's the thing that uh you know one there's a real paucity of practice around in general be it you know, via a digitally mediated one or a paper one, people are so scared of making any marks on books or or having any sort of more concrete reflections. So there's a there's a real lack of praxis in terms of a deeper reading there. Um, and two, it's the it's the thing that we we have the the greatest opportunity to be able to modify because we have the ability to non destructively modify books so that they are sort of individually kind of rendered meaningful for the purposes of an individual reader. Um, in terms of the social practice of that, like uh, that's something that I I think um, I'm less connected to the. I think it would be important to start to 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 meet the the state of the art halfway, so to speak, in terms of what are the most accepted and common ter uh, mechanisms that people use to uh, to to develop a relationship with the text in that regard. Like in, in terms of Dini's practice, like. Did you learn that, or is that something that is uh, composed of some accepted practice within academia or elsewhere? Uh, I, I would be really curious about people's capacity to um, throw rights but in books. But yeah, Dini, what wh where did it come from? What you do? Um, that's that's a good question. I was going to say I mentioned that my husband won't let me borrow his books at all, right? Because I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> constantly consume them. But I also think of legacy. Um, as I got older, I realized that I'm going to be leaving my library to people, mm -hmm. and they're going to. And if you put a library together and you see what people mark up, what their marginality is, it says a lot about a person. Yeah. Right. So what ideas were interesting? And just to add to that, when I was going through my library just about two years ago, I don't have children, right? And so I was going through this discussion with someone about being childless and I picked up my I have a whole section here of feminist writings from the 70s when I was a young girl reading about feminism and I was opening up these books and going I had stuff in marginalia I never want kids I'm never getting married you know? and I've forgotten I was so anti-marriage right because I've been married so long now and um but you know kids are gonna destroy my life you know kind of stuff and so um and so, yeah, that, that, it tells a lot about a person at their time of life. But the practice of this came from being dyslexic. So I, I have mild dyslexia, and my mother recognized it, even though it wasn't something that people talked about. She realized I had a photographic memory. The doctor told her one of the two times I went to the doctor as a child, what, she was afraid of my memory. It was scaring her. So she took me to the doctor to see what was wrong with me. Because it was almost like witchcraft, and so the doctor said, "Well, she's got I, she's got photographic memory, and it's a bad thing because she'll never really become smart. She'll just rely on her memory." And what they didn't realize is I had trouble reading anyway. So she began giving me a steady dose of crossword puzzles and cryptograms and things to get my eyes to memorize word patterns, so that I could read well, which I did. And then I began marking text so that I could concentrate because I'm also hyperactive. So how can I slow down my mind 
to take in information. So it was some mindful practices that my mother and I developed for myself so that I wouldn't be stupid as the doctor said I would be when I was seven years old. He literally said that in front of me. I was like, I, I'm not going to be stupid. I'm wrong, you son of a bitch. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought at the age of seven. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to meet that guy now. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a fear. Like if you're hyperactive, ADHD, they call it now, you can't concentrate. If you're dyslexic, you can't read. I mean, there's all these things they say, but there's things you can do to get past it. And marking up text, eat consuming text, as I call it. I eat my text. And there's that kind of Zeusian concept that he ate Metis and gave birth to Athena from his head. So that metaphor of eating wisdom and giving birth to new wisdom is the way I always saw it. Just really briefly, Mark, um, Christopher Gutteridge um, Mark and my colleague at Southampton, he pointed out a few years ago that, um, especially with technology, what can be a disability in one side is a superpower in another side. And that's why we have to be careful when we make judgments about what to remove, what to augment, and how to deal with things. And Dini, your initial assessment and your massive cognitive abilities, I think, speaks to that extremely well. Well, they were seen as, um, what was the word, afflictions as a child. So I think that's the thing I try to teach the students is that whatever is the problem with you that people say is a problem with you is actually your superpower. You can turn it into your superpower, right? There's nothing wrong with anybody, really, if they turn it into their superpower. Mark, your hands up, darling. Um Yes. Now, I, I was thinking, fun enough, I'm the same on books, but for a very different reason, fun enough, because I just found that I can't read something that's scribbled all over, even if I've done it, um, which is a different thing. Um, and I stress that because the danger is one, well, you know, well, we, we, we sort of put these nice piles that no, you know, do this or don't do that. And of course, it's so, it's so contextual. Um, I mean, in a sense, I wish I... I wish I could get on with marking up my books because it would be useful. But I know if I did, then I'd, I'd lose my relationship um, with them. Um, but that's a challenge. But then again, you know, I'm left handed. So I was told at a very early age, well, you'll never amount to anything. <laughs> they may have been right. You know? <laughs> um, the reason I put my hand up is I'm just going to flesh out the point I made earlier. And because and, I, I don't want it to sort of seem misread as, you know, basically having a crack at machine learning or something. And this is the point. Um, there was a bit at the end of the thing that Frey was just showing, which saying, OK, this is this is the, the system is saying this might be of interest to a researcher. And my immediate thought is why? Because that's much more. I, I have real trust issues about recommended systems because normally they're rubbish. But if I know why, I, I can normally recommend. I, 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 so I have a very eclectic taste in music. I, I sit in the world music box, which means that I don't just belong in anybody's collection. Um, and I can, but it's really interesting. That's one place where there are lots of recommended systems. And, and you know, sometimes I can see why a system thought, oh, if you like this, you might like that. Um, but that's a really useful part that people forget to do. So I don't really mind if something is a bit off because even if I don't like something, I might see that somebody else might. So that's why it's really useful to surface that. I, I just don't know if the, I don't know if the, the the tools have the sophistication to do that yet. Um, but again, it's giving it's giving the human uh, the human consumer of that text um, something that I think is much more tractable than just saying, yeah, it, you know, it's a bit like somebody sends you something and you're thinking, why? They sent it to you because you thought you might like it, but but yeah. th the assumption was you would immediately know why, and often that isn't the case. So, um, yeah, there's, there's something to dig into there. Thanks. Absolutely, and uh, I do think it's very important that um, the prompts are included, and ideally quite soon I want um, a user to be able to write their own prompts for how to analyze these things. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do with Reader. You open up a proceedings, it goes through everything uh, through AI, but it's the problems that you have edited. So you know the roughness of it. So that's one thing. But uh, Dini, I see you have to leave in a minute. Um, but I just want to ask all of you, 
to think a little bit more about how do we want people to read our book in XR? You, you know, we need, we need to make some decisions on this now because I do think it's possible to release it in XR this time. Uh, As I mentioned, what you showed us the other day is great, but I don't think we can do it all at once this year because we don't have the funding. But if you want to start to pull, tease, uh, te like give us, um, make a list of things that you think we're going to need technologically, we can start to see which ones we can do easily now and then what we can go for. It's, it's extra funding we need. We don't have the funding even next year for this. So yeah. we need to write we need to write what we call the side quest grants, which, you know, Andrew and I have done already for our side quests. So this is, this is kind of a side quest. Yeah. I mean, the, the document that I shared with all the kind of examples kind of is that we need to decide in the community of what's prioritized, what people think is interesting, and then we'll see how we can cobble it together. But we do need um, the basic framework. So let me just put you on the spot, Randall. Um, what medium should we use? Should we just do WebXR and just be happy with that? We, we have to have uh, some for, a, for a book? For, yeah, for our book, which we want people to view in a relatively traditional way in XR, and sorry, yeah, in XR, but also to draw things out of. One of them I absolutely want is to be able to draw out a mural because it's just mind boggling and a few other things like that. Um, yeah, what, sh what should we do? We need to settle on a thing and then we can see about the resources like Dini said. Thank you, Dini. Love you. <laughs> okay, I know you hate that you. photo, but we just, you know, just saying. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. Um, okay, so uh, as I've said uh, a couple of times in the past, WebXR, as a as a technology is you know in my mind primarily there it's a stepping stone toward a more declarative uh, capacity for being able to spatialize documents. That capacity does not exist, d will not exist for the, the coming three to five years. You know, in terms of in, in terms of one, anybody coming up with it in the first place, and two, any sort of commonality in, in terms of multiple participants within the market having the ability to be able to address it and, and kind of meet at the standard. So, you know, what's going to happen to HTML at some point is that somebody, maybe Apple, maybe Samsung, maybe Google, maybe Meta, um, are going to start proposing extensions and 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 augmentations of, of what it is for a, a page per se to be able to kind of present itself within space. I am personally on behalf of Apple, building the proposal that puts 3D models into pages as the first kind of foray. And it and it necessitates some some ideas that inevitably kind of spatialize aspects of the page. But that is not the the main bulk of the work. It's just the the the, the sharp end of the 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 wedge um for 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 breaking some of those ideas open. And you know the question is how hard is that in terms of how much it destabilizes the integrity of a notion of a web page uh before the the rest of these problems necessarily kind of follow and people need to kind of figure out what the hell is a browser now. Um, so in a, in a, in in ten years, it would be my hope that it's HTML. Um, in five years, I would hope that we would want to be able to recommend some mixture of uh, HTML and WebXR in the one to three year time frame. It's unequivocally, unfortunately, WebXR as the the the, the least worst solution for something that is uh, sort of intrinsically and effortlessly spatial. Um, I think that there are some interesting things you'd be able to do today with a Safari and a Vision Pro and being able to put a window here and a window here and have those things uh, talk to each other. You can make monoscopic 3D views of those things uh, as WebGL views uh, of the kind that you see before you jump into WebXR today. Uh, you also have the ability to render HTML model elements if you have that enabled. Um, the, the, there's a Pretty embarrassing paucity of, of capability and expressive power there. I am fixing it, I promise. Um, uh, one of the other things that you can do uh, that's pretty interesting from having multiple windows is, uh, I don't know, uh, Andrew, if you've played with these, but having uh, broadcast connections between multiple windows that are on the same domain means that you have a sort of a 90 FPS real-time connection between all existing windows uh, that you have the ability to kind of... Um, to, to, to connect to each other so that, so that you do something here and it turns up here and here. 
So you can you can make a wraparound display. You, you need to have you know the user has to be responsible for putting things there. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Frodo. Like uh, I want to make the web, uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript be the the thing, the basis for what spatial web is, and such that we have the ability to create these these notional spaces like my um, what do I call it? Um, what a prototype prototype exhibit hall. Uh, yeah, that's 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 going to be a while. So, uh, yeah, Mark, go first, sorry. Yeah, I was just interested in picking Brandon's point. So in a sense that, I mean, what you're describing is, thinking back to a conversation I had with someone this morning, when they talked about HTML, they were talking about their experience of the web in the 90s, and HTML's moved a long way. And to, so to a certain extent, there is the literal meaning of the term, uh, as opposed to almost the environment you're talking about, which is the separation of the the word symbols, the letter symbols, and the, the text and all the richness that conveys, and then effectively this, this markup sitting upon it. Now, to those who've noodled around with the web a bit, that means at the moment mainly putting um, sort of visualization markup of it in terms of text styling. But it doesn't take much of a stretch to see that that's basically extensible. The, the, the interesting challenge, and this is, some of the things, this is what was in my mind actually, I was writing a paper for for a post on this year was, so where does that take our writing tools? Because, so if I'm writing about something and I just want to, I just want to put in a 3D model, you know, because I, I think most most people, probably not necessarily those in this room, you know, don't want to sit at a, a, a as it were, at a sort of code, you know, at an IDE to write. Um, and and yet, to a certain extent, that's uh, for some things a bit of an inevitability at the moment, simply because you know we haven't. Uh, the tools haven't evolved yet. Um, and I think it's really quite interesting. Um, I mean, I don't know what the answer is. I just hope it's not going to be sort of the same mistakes perhaps we made innocently with sort of WYSIWYG word processes, where you end up pixel pushing around the screen instead of actually thinking onto the virtual page. Um, so there's some lovely challenge in that. But I think it's really interesting that that, that there's a purity there. And it's the same as sort of happens with XML. So you've got the the stream of symbols, you know, if it's text, separated from some sort of markup. And we even have things now like I was it was something that I saw, it was the people who are noodling around with what they were calling standoff markup. But one of the things they they were happy about is they were using uh they were using zero length Unicode uh characters to insert anchors into a text flow invisibly and i thought yeah then that's a sort of that's a really useful lateral thinking that we sort of need so that because otherwise um because it can be quite difficult i think to explain these things to people because unless you show them the you know one that's absolutely finished which is hard to do when you're still building the tool they sort of say well how would it work or you know or more that they say it can never work well i think it can um but so that's going to be an interesting thing to see the blending of things that probably we would have hitherto seen as design, whether visual design or code design, um, with um, writing spaces that, that currently are broadly purely writing spaces. So to kind of narrow it down, what I want for the book as the editor with Dini is to, and this has been the same all along, it's just we've learned more open up a document in my Vision Pro, forget the other ones, I want to do it in Vision Pro, but it should be open, obviously, to any hardware platform. It should appear beautifully rendered, maybe massive page, I don't know, that's not really the point. And if there's a 3D model, I should be able to pull it out. If there is a Brandle mural, I should be able to pull it out, do a few interactions. That's it. But the key is, it cannot be in a lockdown weird format which is, I think, what both Randall and Mark were talking about. This needs to be in a way that in 10 years, 50 years, whatever, a system can go back and understand what it is. That is why I'm such a big fan of metadata at the end of the document. Now, whether it's in a PDF like we talked about, or whether it's in LaTeX, or whether it's in this, that, and the other, whether it's in chocolate sauce or peanut, I don't care. But what I do think we need to do is something we have the capability now and if you look at the gucci uh, app for vision pro by the way brandley you've seen it right gucci the fashion brand i haven't no it's one in one sense really basic in another sense it's kind of inspirational 
But when you look at these experiments now, like early iPad apps type things, we got to have something cool to show in September. We got to start experimenting. So what is the basic platform we should use? Is it WebXR now? Uh, what, what, do we, what do we think? Let's just pick one. Um, so if it's WebXR, then the thing that's being displayed fundamentally is not the thing that can be readable and transferable, uh, unfortunately, because WebXR is a mechanism for displaying pixels. Whereas HTML is a, a, a method for encoding semantic or, or visual display information. So you can read HTML uh, or JSON or whatever and have that display as WebXR, but whatever is ultimately being displayed as WebXR is, is, is not, that's a, that's a, a, a write-only process. There's no reading back from anything useful that is fundamentally at, at, uh, become WebXR per se. Um, so that's sad. But uh, so so, uh, but it's at the same time it's the only way at this point on anybody's device to be able to build an intrinsically sort of full time spatial representation of anything. Uh, so uh, you're you're sort of uh, in a bind because you need something to turn into WebXR in order to make it spatial today. But the thing that you you read from in order to do that that transcoding uh, uh, has to be something else. Uh, in order to read. And, you know, so people might use GLTF. This is the 3D file format. Um, USD will hopefully uh, supersede that in terms of being, you know, like before the days I mean, uh, of JPEG, uh, there were just an inordinate number of, before PNG and JPEG, there were an inordinate number of file formats. It was a real headache. And uh, we're, we're now down to two or three. Uh, most of the time, you know, people have WebP and HEIC, and that's annoying that there's this new profusion of, of like, oh, but what about this piece? Um, I would like that to stop. But uh, yeah, like w if we can go back to the good old days of maybe 10 years ago, um, uh, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like there are halcyon days of anything. But um, images were simpler back then than they were 10 years before that. And uh, and if we can get a, you know, a period of relative peace within 3D file formats, then hopefully it'll be down to GLTF and USD. Um, those are not good document formats either. So, so yeah, it... Um, Unfortunately, yeah, it has to be WebXR today, and it also has to be something that is not somehow intrinsically 3D and that you kind of read, yeah. So that's a very good point. Um, a lot of this does not need to be known beforehand to be 3D. For instance, I don't think it's a problem if the book itself opens as a flat document. I don't, th I'm talking about, you know, for the near future for this book. I don't think it's a problem that if you pull something else, the original document doesn't know what happens. It's just, here's some data, the user's reading environment now has access to it. So if there's a 3D model, as we've talked about before, I think that could be very easily encoded into the document as a screenshot. The document has encoded that where, where it is, like a link. So the reading environment can parse that metadata and say, oh, this is tapped on, that means show this document, this object in 3D, fine. Same goes for stereo video. Um, you know, a little thumbnail, we have the metadata, there it is, tap on it, it comes out. Now, I am spending a month optimizing author, spending more money than I should to make it more commercially useful, which is why I'm going to send you guys a survey. Uh, we're doing things like the uh, LaTeX export, but there's no reason I couldn't put a little bit of effort in there into when you click on an image in author, um, you, you can fill in all, you know, the date and all that stuff. Now, I can fill in other fields that says something like original file is on page 37 if it's big or online or whatever. All of these things I can do now for text testing. So I basically need to know how we want that to go. How does that want to go to whoever's building the WebXR or other environments so we can start playing around with it? Well, I'll, I'll, just quickly to respond to your last, it's interesting because I think one of the things that we've already sort of needled around it is that more intentional essential glossing by the author of the relationship between uh, textual content and uh, non-text flow objects like tables, um, pictures, graphs, whatever, um, is something to explore 
I, I mean, I know we put in, you know, C figure four or something, and we have and we have sort of mechanisms and processes for that, but actually moving beyond that in a sense of of just thinking about, no, no, actually what I'll do is I'll just make sure, no, this paragraph, this paragraph has an association with that picture um, in the way that someone who's doing something else with the text that I don't even know about, it will be useful to know that this belongs with that. So the question, turning the question around is, how do you capture that? Because you you not only have to capture it at the image, but you would, therefore, you're going to be doing some more markup, some more hidden markup on the document. So one thought. Um, and I was thinking about um, Brandel's point about, you know, well, what we can't have. And I'm thinking, OK, so ever the pragmatist. So what does that what does that give us then? You know, so what what can we make looking into the fridge, <laughs> you know, a badly stocked shelf? And I'm thinking, well, OK, um, if I sort of peel back. So we know we can we can present text and we present it um, quite well, but not in the way that we'd like or in the context we'd like. But we can do that. So we could do some of the sort of the wow sort of typography that you're talking about. It's a sort of big, impressive, you know, the, your coffee table book on steroids. Um, but but the question is, so that but we have to do that in in this sort of rather fixed format. But therefore, maybe the way to use the the XR bits we can do is to provide some sort of magic source in between. It's how you navigate between these things. So you may get to something that looks very much like what you're used to on a bit of this. But actually, you're getting there in a in a more interesting way. I mean, I don't know how that manifests, but I think that's something that seemingly the technology allows. So we need so we need to sort of turn it around, saying, "What do we want to do?" And say, "Well, what will it let us do?" Okay, well, if we can, if we're going to be navigating broadly from a quasi textual display to textual display, what would a fun and interesting and absorbing way to be to do that? Uh, and and you know and and that doesn't just use nostrums we're dragging from the past, so that we're not you know we're, we're not just recreating something old in something new. Um, and I'm also conscious that in terms of things we have to play with, something that we've had for quite a long time is, in, when it comes to mural, is um, the timeline information that's been in collecting its way in the books with which we've never done anything. But it's uh, if there's anything that's, that's a timeline, it's a timeline. So you know. It tends to have a long access in one thing, and it and it presents with all sorts of display difficulties, which I I I certainly know from from practice. But I don't think that you know, again that doesn't mean we can't do something fun with it because there are some rather nice fun challenges in it. So it's things like you know folding the millions of years between the Earth cooling and the dinosaurs coming sort of thing because we sort of know that we probably don't want to see that at actual size. Um, and thinking actually how that plays into the experiments we've done thus far with sort of, you know, pinch and zoom and things like that. So there's some really good dog fooding stuff that I think we can do. We have information that that might seem not sexy, but the point is it's it's coherent in a real world sense. It's lumpy. It has all the things we don't want, but it is something we can actually play with. And we can lay that over some of the things that we want to do, I think, to to good effect. And, you know, again, if the, if the answer is it turns out that, well, we don't want to do that again, that's still a win, actually, to my mind. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, uh, Brandel, uh, I'm going to get to you in a second, but Andrew, uh, obviously you're not going to work on this, don't worry. But let's pretend you were, right? Let's pretend that you have been tasked as the brilliant coder that you are to deliver our book in XR, in WebXR rather, to make it specific. Um, just opening up something that is basic text in a rectangle, that's something you've already done, right? So the second thing would be making the system aware that on certain rectangles, there are certain goodies that load when interacted with. That's not rocket science or huge amount of work, right? Because the renderings of these exist. So a really simple example of opening up a 3D model of something based on tapping inside a document is we could we should be able to get someone to do that for a reasonable effort, right? So we can experiment. What do you think based on what you've already done? Yeah, I mean, it would be easier than what I'm doing because it wouldn't have to be variable from what I understand. It's just for this book. Yes. Um, so you could just hard code a bunch of stuff. You wouldn't have yes. to make it dynamically adjust for things, which would be faster to program. Um, 
I think the the bit that might get be getting overlooked is uh, it took us a long time to get to the text rendering in the box in a way that we liked. Um, you can throw text in the screen pretty quick, um, but we went through a lot of iterations to actually get to where we're comfortable in the space um, and to get the pinching and stuff working and things like that. Um, so if we have a distinct plan now and we're like, yeah, just do the same thing, uh, I don't think that would be too difficult um, for whoever's programming this. Um, but if they have to reinvent some stuff, then it would, of course, take longer. So we, we may then benefit from you spending an hour or two teaching someone what you have for them to go off in the other direction, right? Uh, maybe. I assume they'd want to still write their own code, but they would probably want to, if, you, if you're trying to do the same feel as MySpace, they'd probably want to um, look at my code and reference it when they build their own. Because there's way more bloat in mine than you would need for just a single document, right? Because I have to account for everything. Good point. Um, but yeah, they could they could copy the code. I think it'd be at least an easier start. Do you know anyone in your community who may want to work on this? Um, not not with certainty. Um, I've got someone in mind who might be interested, um, but I'll have to talk to him about it. Okay, that would be lovely. If there is interest, we would definitely find a way to pay for it. Thank you, Andrew. Randall, what other great solutions do you have for us today? Oh, uh, I wasn't necessarily going to solve anything, sorry. But uh, just that uh, uh, I think what Mark was saying about having a timeline being neat and that being kind of enough is uh, a really interesting point. So something that I've been thinking about a lot is the fact that, like, so uh, a Kindle and other things uh, like it, uh, Apple I I iBooks or whatever it's called now, um, those solve the problem proximally of doing the immediate sort of task of reading pretty pretty well. But there's this broader practice of what reading entails. And it's a social practice and it's an intellectual one that it sort of very suddenly falls down off a cliff. And, you know, I've been talking to people recently about just the absolute travesty it is that Amazon bought Goodreads and that that's another part of reading that they have utterly slept on uh, as as a thing that could have turned into like another billion dollar industry trillion like just in terms of like what it is that reading is what people have gotten out of books and how they interact with each, each other on that thing it could have been it could have been pubmed it could have been uh, all of these incredible sort of repositories of knowledge and people sharing and and it's and it's just a thing that like i mean Mark uses it very judiciously, and I appreciate his diligence for it. And I think that hopefully it helps. But like, it's 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 not hard to see that it could have been a lot more. Anyway, um, but yeah. So so uh, in terms of, uh, of of sort of things like timelines, uh, you you do have to be a little bit more opinionated about what you want to get out of a book. Uh, you, and there are going to be some places where it's hit and miss. And so far as like a timeline of something is not going to be as as relevant, but. I think it's a pretty sort of perennially relevant thing if you have a large collection of people, a large collection of actions that some kind of spatio-temporal kind of representation of those people in those places uh, uh, has, a, has a broad sort of range of relevance for being able to kind of contextualize and separate those concepts. And so, yeah, I think that that would be a really, really good start. So, you know, geospatially locating all of the 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 sort of relevant sites of publication, the the timelines of when they were published or when people were born. Uh, you know, there are some really interesting things that people have done by visualizing the crossover periods in different historical people's lives by pulling that information out of the info boxes and Wikipedia. And uh, I haven't done that. And, you know, for that, I apologize. But I think that those are, those are the kinds of things that are sort of immediate uh, ready to hand as uh, sort of mechanisms and capabilities that are not intrinsically sort of required to be within virtual reality, but the real estate, as I sort of, sort of said many years ago, like uh, th this isn't about VR per se, but space. It's about having the ability to kind of regard and construct these artifacts in a way that isn't invasive into the central task of actually going over a specific document. And so when you have the ability to put, put together these incidental and attendant artifacts, uh, you know what? What? What do you start reaching for more more quickly than others? Uh, is is the thing to do with it, whether it happens to be in something where you assemble the pixels, or if somebody's gone to the effort of building a folding chart of all of the timelines uh, and things like that. So yeah, hopefully that's a collection of things, but hopefully it answers some question.
So that's very exciting. So what I think we should do is exactly that. I think we should build a, find a way to build a PDF looking thing just for the sake of simplicity that is a nice size, a bit bigger than normal, with more, maybe an entire article per rectangle, whatever it might be, and then find an axis, you know, literal axis for a timeline that is off to the side all the time. And if the, and also optimize selection of text. So uh, currently selection is a bit weird, but maybe we do it so if anything is a keyword, it's more selectable. I don't know if that's even feasible. But, and then we take all five future textbooks into this, not just one. And then we provide other uh, kind of axes or lines in space. One of them could be alphabetical list of authors. Because here we have enough authors rather than a proceedings, which is a bit different. We could also do um, some topics based on the way we talked about it. So you're, you're, it's based on you're reading something. You come across, let's say, Doug Engelbart. You do a thing and then you see Doug Engelbart on the timeline, right? And then you may choose to put the document to the side or not. These really show space. Mark, thank you for bringing up the timeline because it's a dimension literally and figuratively. So, Brandel, you've done a lot of work on this already. Do you have any code that you can provide to the pot? Uh, timeline VR is public and out there. I, I don't, I don't, I don't build in the sense of having a sort of compile and build. I, I write everything in plain text, and so there's no more readable version of it than than what I have out in public today. Um, uh, for better or worse, uh, people often ask me for my source files, and they're like you're looking at them. Um, the uh, the the kinds of things that need to be pulled out and identified and understood are not really better formed than people being able to sort of take it conceptually. I saw in the in the you know the Twitter group DM that people have um, people have started building a, um, a a WebGL magazine or book that looks suspiciously like the the, the one that I uh, that I built in twenty one or twenty twenty one twenty two twenty two um uh and somebody built a an hours long um tutorial video for how to put it together so that that's exciting it means that people will be will be um hopefully leveraging that more more heavily for for visualization of the stuff but yeah i don't um i've done a timeline and timeline vr but um in terms of what what people can use to work from um i think that probably actually andrew's source code is is the more relevant in terms of what what one does i have the mine has the ability to format text because it actually starts its life in html but it's uh it's a lot more onerous in terms of what the sort of composition and production process of it is because it it needs to generate generate the custom geometry such that um, every single glyph is is rendered um which has is performant and it also means that you have the benefit of being able to export it into blender and other places to to, to look at but um yeah uh, less user friendly, perhaps, than than something that built based off of um, Troika, which I had not yet discovered at the time that I built it. So, if we're serious about the book in XR, then probably what we should do, and this would be discussed with Dini, of course, uh, is ask Andrew to fork off uh, the basic environment so he removes some of the more obvious, as you call it, Andrew bloats, due to the fact that this has been a research project. Um, put it on some kind of a repository. Uh, and then start experimenting with real data and get an external coder to build some of these interactions, right? How do we actually do this is, is my question, if we're serious about doing it. Um, I think Mark's on to it and uh, having a corpus of data first is, important, is an important thing, making sure that uh, from to, to the best of one's ability, it, it, it has the ability to construct a a visible thing. Uh, it might even be, you know, it's it's not a, an enormous amount of work to to build a, a a null view of that, be it in you know Excel or whatever else to go like, yeah, no, this is the thing that it should look like, um, and then and then passing that on to somebody to be able to kind of as a starter pack of you know a dozen data points or so or whatever, um, and then and then get them to build that and then uh, sort of expand that out to a larger larger set of things. I mean, one of the things that is challenging with WebXR at this point is particularly on the on a quest, but you know, also Vision Pro is not limitless in terms of its capability, 
um, is that the sort of the performance implications of different approaches are uh, have different sort of pitfalls, which is something that Andrew's um, valiantly and uh, hopefully successfully done battle with recently is uh, needing to needing to um, combine certain things into bodies of text rather than having them as independently addressable for the benefit of being able to minimize the draw calls. So somebody who's plausibly confluent in those concepts is probably a necessity, but yeah. Um, starting with something that you know that people will be able to render, getting them to render it, and then uh, taking it from there. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> that's really weird. I, I have a go. Yeah, we have a... Um... We have a timeline, and it can be exported in lots of different formats, of course. But I mean, for for Brandel, just you know, I said essentially when I said we sort of mashed it, it was really that some things are very short, and others come with a bit of a story attached. And so there's you have to start making a decision as to where you make the cut because really you want to you you in other words the labels are not of a consistent length. So the kind of thing that the second pass thing that you, we'd need to do. Is is sort of go back over that and ju and just say well something you know some things are basically going to need an additional text field or we just put it somewhere knowing that we're not going to show it it doesn't matter but but is to give the the person who's building it less less sort of turbulence than they otherwise find because you know if everything just keeps overflowing the boxes and this kind of thing that's not helping so that that was what I'd started thinking about in terms of saying, okay, it's there, we don't want to lose it, but just let's, and I I literally think I did it on a character count or something, which is a bit brutal, really. Um, but that was basically because I was trying to do it in a rush for Adam, and I didn't, what it really needed doing was somebody just take a little bit longer to go through and essentially just rewrite the things. So that, yeah, rewrite that the sounds, long bit, yep. Sounds mostly harmless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. For my my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law was not familiar with that. I was very confused. Um, uh, yeah, th th that's uh, something that I've uh, immediately noticed upon doing anything more ambitious with social network analysis and other things like that is the generation of a social graph that doesn't have some really, really ready to hand mechanism for summarization and, and being able to sort of understand the priority of these things. Looking at this timeline in the PDF photo is like, well, what this has however many like 2000 line items something like that um what do you what do you do to to show the most important hundred and how can you make a sort of a discursive kind of mode that allows you to expand and contract those different things in order to be able to figure out where the most interesting thing is um that's, that's a challenge uh, so yeah yeah that, I, I gotta go I, I have some obligations but um uh, that's the kind of thing we need to dig into, absolutely. But on a pure project management level, I think it's time to get started so we can do some rough tests and then we can, you know, with, with the kind of presentation and interaction, um, you know, to, to begin with, just having whatever export format it needs, whatever database we need to run it through, whatever manual work we need, that, you know, that's not a problem. It's just donkey work. I can do that. Well, I, I, I can dig up... I wouldn't worry too much about the PDF. We've done a lot of extract. I, I think the place to start is with the the JSON that's been produced because that's been done. Yeah, yeah of course. Which will, allow, which will allow people to play around with, to go back to say, actually, that was really cool, but what I really want is this and I want, and that's fine. Um, and that will probably involve us in not doing sort of essentially uh, donkey work that we might have to do several times over as as the space. Oh, the one thing to throw into that is to think about um, one of the things, and it's like if you think about um, Bob's mural, his long, um, you know, Narex one about the you know, our march towards nuclear winter or whatever, is that um, is the stranding, and that's something that hasn't been done. So it's picking out, and 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 it, again, it will be terribly lumpy, and it won't be consistent because that's how real world data is. But there are probably some strands that we can pick out, and another sort of link I draw is when we were talking about. Um, sort of subject matter and what articles do. We might think about, well, not, not in the pedestrian sense of this word is used by this article, but this person is actually talking about the emergence of writing tools. Right, well, you know, here's, here's a strand that shows you 
how we got to where we are. So I think within this, there's actually some quite rich things that we can do, but it's going to be iterative because basically what you have to do is mine into it. Fine. And it's a, it's a yin and yang of you make something that looks pretty, but doesn't tell you anything to something that tells you an awful lot and looks bloody awful. And then you just, you've just got to iterate. Yeah, I, I agree. And a lot of that's going to be editorial. So it's going to be an interesting issue. Um, Andrew, before you go, um, if the task was to open up a document and to present it as a document and go from page to page in an XR environment, uh, if we were to use what you have already, how do you take the data in to sh in the document? Is it, um, yeah, what is it, JSON or what? What's inside the box? Well, it's it's currently the HTML versions of the ACM papers. So it's the so it's HTML that you currently use. Yeah. Um, but it's it's specifically going off the ACM formatting. Sure. So you need to have the same tags and things like that, because that's how it's referencing things. Okay. That's that's um, good. I, I have to go. Um, but yeah. good conversation. Go. But thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. And um, very useful. I look forward to um, to, to moving on with this. We need a uh, we need our book in XR, and I highly recommend um, the Gucci app both praise and criticism, it's um, at least it's a real thing. And if you can get the Balenciaga one to work, please tell me, it just doesn't play right on my headset. Interesting, I'll take a look. Can we have the future of text in XR this year? It's only one way to find out. <laughs> yes, try. Okay, love you guys, bye for now. Bye. Hey guys. Oh, uh, oh, it's good. Uh,